Good morning, church family. We will be reading Psalm 96. I read, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. Our next reading is Acts 11, reading from verses 1 to 18. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in a city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send a job of a Simon who is, called, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came onto them, and as he heard come onto us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then even to Gentiles God has granted repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thanks very much, Mario, for, for reading that so well. Um, my name is Jacob Osborne. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, and I'm a member of the congregation here at CCB. And uh, we're giving our regular preachers, Andy and Johnny, a bit of a break over the summer. And uh, as you can see, we're going through this series in the Psalms, Sing to the Lord, All the Earth. As we open God's word together this morning, why don't we bow our heads in prayer? Lord God, we know that you are the source of all truth, of all wisdom, of all consolation, of all peace. We pray that as we spend time in your word today, that you would speak to us through it, and that our hearts and minds would be transformed by the riches of your grace bestowed upon us through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I wonder if you've ever heard of a man called Ignaz Semmelweis. Semmelweis was a, a Hungarian doctor who practiced at a maternity hospital in Vienna in the 1840s. New babies were being born at this hospital every day. And at this time in history, most mothers in Europe gave birth at home. Those who gave birth in hospitals tended to do so because of poverty or, or illegitimacy. And because of the lack of hygiene in these hospitals, many mothers suffered from a severe bacterial infection called childbed fever. 
And as a result, mortality rates for new mothers in hospitals were as high as 30%. Well, Semmelweis decided to try and find out the cause of childbed fever. And he came to the conclusion that students in his hospital were carrying the infection with them from patient to patient. He ordered all his students to wash their hands between treating patients. And as a result of this, the mortality rates for mothers at his hospital fell from 18% to 1%. Well, this, the significance of Semmelweis's discovery is enormous. He laid the foundation for scientists like Louis Pasteur and Joseph Lister to establish more hygienic conditions in hospitals. His work has saved thousands, possibly millions, of lives. But Semmelweis was not appreciated in his own time. In fact, when he published a book on this subject, most of the medical and scientific community of the time rejected his ideas. They preferred their own wrong-headed theories about why the infection came about. The widespread backlash against Semmelweis cost him his career, his mental health, and eventually his life. Semmelweis brought a message that was transformational for poor mothers across Europe. He had a message that brought life, and yet he was rejected by wider society. People preferred their own traditions and beliefs, whatever the cost. Well, I, I thought of Semmelweis when the results of the latest UK census were released last year. In England and Wales, for the first time in about probably one and a half thousand years, the number of people who reported that they were Christian fell below 50%. The numbers have been in decline for, for many years, and, and of course, many of those who identify as Christian may well be Christian in name only. The proportion of the UK population, after all, which, which goes to church regularly, is about 5%. The idea of the UK as, as some kind of Christian country is long gone. Just like Semmelweis, Christians today have a message that brings life, but it's even better it's eternal life. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ that gives us the opportunity to spend eternity with God. And yet, most of our country doesn't seem interested. The gospel is rejected by wider society. People prefer their own traditions and beliefs, whatever the cost. It can sometimes feel as if the odds are increasingly stacked against us when mainstream Christian views come under attack in the media, when we're pressured to conform to a certain pattern of beliefs, when we stop sharing our faith with others because we expect uncomfortable questions. How can we be confident as UK Christians as the numbers continue to fall? How can we sing more boldly about Jesus Christ when wider society seems to be retreating from him? Well, Psalm 96 is a wonderful encouragement for us. It speaks of God's faithfulness to us in times of trouble. And it reminds us that if we focus too much on the numbers in our own country, we can become distracted from the broader picture of what God is doing, both here and around the world. So do open your Bibles back up to uh, Psalm 96, page 448, I think. Let's take a look at it. Here's the first point. Sing to the God above all gods. Look down with me at verse 1. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous deeds among all peoples. Do you see the intensity of this worship in the first few verses? In verse 1, the psalmist tells us, Sing to the Lord a new song. In other words, sing his praises again and again and again. Respond new, afresh to the wonders of the Lord God. And verse 2 hammers this home, proclaim his salvation day after day. Why are the Israelites to do this? Well, the psalmist continues in verse 4. Have a look. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty 
are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Now, a version of this psalm was sung when King David brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And we see that in in 1 Chronicles. Um, The Ark was brought back many years after it was stolen by the Philistines. Uh, This painting by the Italian artist Domenico Gargiulo captures the grandeur of the occasion quite well. The Ark was the most sacred object for the ancient Israelites. And having it stolen by a foreign nation will have been profoundly distressing. They will have felt like an embattled minority, surrounded by suspicious or openly hostile people. They will have felt as if the odds were stacked against them. And yet the ark comes home. It returns. And that return is a a clear sign of God's salvation for the Israelites, the way he keeps them safe from the enemies that surround them. Look at the the joyous language in verse 6. God is characterized by splendor and majesty. His sanctuary, his place of safety, shows his strength and glory. Now, the other nations surrounding the Israelites had a variety of idols or or gods which they worshipped. Gods like Baal, the the, the sun god of the Phoenicians, or or Hadad, uh, the Canaanite god of rain and storms. These idols offered everything and delivered nothing. And they're now in museums for us to look at. And these are contrasted with the one true god of the Israelites. Now, I've never been much of a fan of puns, especially not the ones that Mark Taylor bombards us with in various church WhatsApp groups. But punning is actually an ancient art form. And there's a pun in this psalm in the original Hebrew. In verse 5, the the gods of the nations, Elohim, are described as idols, Elohim, which literally means nothings or, or nobodies. The Elohim are Elohim. The gods are nothings. The mighty gods are mightily useless. They're ridiculous. They can't protect you. But the Lord made the heavens. Idols lead us on a path to destruction. God leads us on a path to salvation. Well, of course, in in the modern day, we may not have physical carved idols of other gods on our shelves. But there are many things in our lives which tempt us away from living like Jesus. It could be a particular romantic relationship or a, or a career or attaining a certain standard of living. There's nothing wrong with these things in themselves, but if we stake our entire sense of worth or happiness or fulfillment on them, we'll be disappointed. People are flawed and, and no relationship will be perfect. Prioritizing our careers will take us away from our families and friends. And however much money or possessions we accumulate, it will never be enough. If you're here today looking in on on Christian things, I want to tell you that the idols of our modern day cannot satisfy you. But Jesus Christ can. Psalm 96 actually anticipates the coming of Jesus Christ into our world. Look again at verse 6. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. We know from the four eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life and death that he was the Son of God. We know that he came to earth from heaven, that in doing miracles on earth, he displayed his splendor and majesty. We know that Jesus was violently executed on a cross. In doing so, he took the punishment that we deserve for our sin. He healed our relationship with God. And by rising from the dead, he gave us the opportunity to have eternal life with him in heaven. He gives us the ability to leave behind our mistakes and our failures. He gives us forgiveness. He gives us sanctuary. So how do we respond to this psalm in in light of Jesus' life and death? We sing to the Lord a new song. We proclaim his salvation day after day. We praise God above all things. When the ark returned, there was wild celebration among the Israelites. You may know the story of King David dancing in celebration during the night. And we too should be joyful in response to God's glory. We should lift up our voices to our Lord God in praise. 
And that's not just about singing more. It's about acknowledging God in everything that we do, praising him for a new day, for his wonderful creation, for the delights of friendship, for giving us forgiveness. One of the privileges of getting to know our brothers and sisters in the Gambia this year was seeing the the joy and energy with which they praise God. The Gambia is 90% Muslim. Christians are very much in the minority and there are increasing areas of persecution. And yet when I would ask a Gambian Christian how they were, they would always, without fail, respond, praise God. Even if they were having a terrible day, praise God. One day we visited a a tiny rural church in the village of Parang. And uh, during the service, an announcement was made from the front that all the adults in church needed to bring a bag of cement to the service the following week. This was so that they could build uh, a small wall around the church compound to prevent wild animals from eating their vegetables. This is not a well-off church. And yet it had some of the best and most enthusiastic church music I have ever heard even with a six-year-old drummer. (laughs) It was clear to me that this church is really living out the call to sing to the Lord a new song, even though materially they have far less than we do in Britain. Look again at verse four. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. A relationship with our heavenly father richly satisfies us in ways nothing else can. God's power and might and strength are far greater than any earthly idol, than any government, than any census. We can know that though at times we might feel like an embattled minority in the UK, we have the creator of the universe on our side. If God is for us, who can stand against us? The more that we praise God's name in the day to day, the the greater confidence we'll have as British Christians. God is working in the UK. And we we see that in the way he's wonderfully brought new believers into our church. Praise his name. Well, here's the second point of Psalm 96. Sing to the God who reigns over all nations. Sing to the God who reigns over all nations. Now, you might think that because the ark has come back, the psalmist would adopt a tone which would be quite gloating or or, or triumphalist, that he'd laugh at the other nations and call for their destruction. Uh, Perhaps a little bit like how some people in the US responded to the death of Osama bin Laden with partying and laughter. The other nations are hated enemies of the Israelites. They stole the ark. But here's the surprise. The psalmist doesn't do that. Look down with me at verse 7. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. So the psalmist calls upon all nations to worship God, not just the ancient Israelites. He calls all nations to join God's family. The sign outside Israel's pub doesn't say no Philistines, no Babylonians, no dogs. It says, come in, have a drink, join us. Well, the word ascribe here essentially means acknowledge and and proclaim. And the psalmist details some of the the practical ways in which God's glory and strength should be acknowledged by all peoples, giving an offering, going into the courts of the temple. And this isn't just rhetoric. Throughout the Old Testament, God brings small numbers of non-Israelites into his family. Ruth, a Moabite, married into an Israelite family. The Lord blessed Obed-Edom, the Gittite, who welcomed King David into his house. And the people of Nineveh turned to God after Jonah had preached there. But it is fair to say that most followers of God at the time of this psalm will have been Jews. But when Jesus came to earth, the gospel spread rapidly from Jews to non-Jews or to Gentiles. 
And our New Testament reading from Acts 11 illustrates this really well. Some of you may have been studying it in, in connect groups recently. Several hundred years after this psalm was written, the apostle Peter is called in a dream to go to the house of a Roman centurion called Cornelius. And he turns up and preaches the gospel to them. Cornelius isn't just a Gentile. He's part of the army which is ruling over the Jews. And so you can imagine that, that, that when Peter comes back to his friends, they're shocked. In their minds, Peter has just gone to eat with the oppressor. And yet God's love overcomes ethnic difference because he reigns over all people. The coming of Jesus means that salvation is no longer primarily for the Jews. It is for every people group on earth. Peter gives Cornelius the gospel and, and Peter's friends, eventually they realize the truth. They say, so then even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Do you see how, how Psalm 96 foreshadows that in verse 10? Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. We're commanded to go out to different people across the world and share with them the good news. But of course, many of our non-Christian friends might raise objections to doing this. These days, people are, are more likely, particularly in the West, to believe that, that multiple faiths, multiple perspectives are equally valid. And so under this relativistic approach, preaching the gospel could come across as some kind of neo-colonialism, an attempt to flatten ethnic or, or cultural differences, to make people more like us. And Christians have not always had a great track record on this point. Um, there are many historical examples of Christian missionaries who have sought both to convert people and to tear them away from their culture. From the 16th century on, white American colonists brought the gospel to a variety of Native American peoples. Some of this was done sensitively, but some colonists sought to force Native Americans to become not just Christians, but Western-style farmers who lived in Western houses and wore Western clothing. But it really shouldn't be that way. And here's why. The late Tim Keller points out in one of his books that 90% uh, of Muslims live in a narrow band from Southeast Asia to Northern Africa. Over 95% of all Hindus are in India. 88% of Buddhists are in East Asia. But Christianity is spread throughout the world. 25% of Christians are in Europe, 25% in Central and Southern America. 22% in Africa, 15% in Asia, and 12% in North America. Part of the reason for this, Keller says, is, is that other faiths require you to adopt a particular culture. Uh, Muslims read the Quran in Arabic and, and uh, wear Arabian clothing. Hinduism and, and Buddhism are inextricably linked with the nationality of their founders. But when Jesus came, he abolished the Jewish food laws and, cer and ceremonies. He said that the temple of God was no longer a physical building, but his own body. He allowed non-Jews to approach him with confidence that they will be, be accepted no matter where they're from. And so Keller continues, when you become a Christian, you don't have to give up your ethnic, cultural or national identity. You don't have to adopt a specific way of life, but your own identity is renewed and reformed. I think Keller's really onto something here. Generally speaking, the gospel is spread most effectively when Christians really know and really understand the culture of the people they're trying to reach, when they're sensitive to people's backgrounds. Bible translation is a great example of this. Um, the whole Bible has been translated into 724 languages throughout history. The New Testament alone, 2,300. But the work isn't finished. Imagine if you had to learn a second language in order to read God's word. That is a reality for one in five people in the world. One in five people don't have a full Bible in their mother tongue. 
So groups like the Wycliffe Bible Translators do fantastic work translating the Bible into various languages around the world. I think it was Nelson Mandela who once said, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his own language, that goes to his heart. And we see this time and time again from the work of Wycliffe Bible translators, that, that lives are transformed by Jesus Christ as a result of reading and understanding the Bible in your own mother tongue. The gospel, in that case, doesn't just go to your head. It goes to your heart. But preaching the gospel to the nations isn't just a job for, for overseas missionaries. Living in London, we, we all have a huge range of opportunities to do this every week. We, we work and live alongside and are friends with people from different religions and, and, and different backgrounds. Look at verse 10 again. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. That's a command to us. The nations are here. They're all around us in Balaam and in London. We have a message that brings life, and it's for everyone. And so when we try and, and, and share our faith with, with people from different backgrounds, we should think ourselves about how we can be sensitive to their culture. So if you're trying to, to share your faith with a Hindu friend, don't take them to a burger joint. Cows are sacred in Hinduism. And if you're trying to share your faith with a Muslim person, be mindful that it can get a little bit complicated if they're a person of the opposite sex. There's a woman at um, Streatham Central Church uh, who puts this approach, this sensitive approach, into practice. She realized years ago that as a woman, she had a ministry opportunity in seeking to reach Muslim women for Christ. Many of these Muslim women would never imagine or even be allowed to speak one-to-one -one with a man who was not their husband. But through this Christian lady at Streatham Central Church, praise God they are hearing the gospel. The Apostle Paul said this in his uh, first letter to the Corinthians. It should be up on the screen behind me. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. The gospel is for all people, friends, because God reigns over all people. But we still need to be sensitive in how we present it. Let's be thinking and, and, and praying in the coming weeks about how we can become ourselves, all things to all people, right here in Balaam. Finally, briefly, here's the, the third point of Psalm 96. Sing to the gods, who will redeem creation. Sing to the God who will redeem creation. Look down with me at verse 11. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. What an image that is. The, the psalmist isn't just calling for, for people to pray and to praise God. But the whole of God's creation, including trees and, and, and fields. Why does the psalmist do this? Well, well, look at verse 13. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Scripture tells us that, that creation is longing for a redeemer. When God created the world, it was perfect in every way. But because of our sin and our unfaithfulness to God, the world has become a place that is increasingly difficult to live in. Climate change is making it impossible for, for millions of people around the world to live, work, and, and provide for their families. Extreme weather events and, and natural disasters are increasingly common. These are all physical reflections and consequences of our rejection of God. Creation longs for a redeemer. 
And yet, despite our sin and unfaithfulness, God is faithful to us. Look at verse 13. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. When the Lord Jesus comes again, creation itself will be redeemed. God's perfect world will be restored. His beautiful, perfect creation will be restored. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. And when that happens, all of creation will sing God's praises. That image of trees and and fields singing is an image of God's sovereignty over all things. And as God redeems all things, he will redeem all people who have accepted his message. This for me is is one of the most exciting things about heaven, that, that we'll get to sing to God alongside people from every nation on earth. We might sometimes feel in the UK that that, that Christians are a tiny minority, but in global terms, that is not the case. Across Asia, Africa, and and, and South America, the number of Christians is massively growing, often in spite of severe persecution from governments or other religions. Um, This is a 12-year-old map. Um, The the numbers will have changed significantly since that time. And, And having that global perspective can be enormously encouraging having Christian brothers and sisters around the world is a a taste, a foreshadow of God's whole created order being redeemed. Christianity started in one city in the Middle East with a tiny ragtag, kind of unpromising group of disciples. By God's grace, it is now spread across the planet. And I think we have a, a microcosm of that in our church today. Um, At CCB, we have a range of ethnic backgrounds, of nationalities, of ages, of people who like Eurovision and those who hate it. (laughs) But in in all seriousness, where else in modern Britain would you get such a diverse mix of people all together and all sharing in the same thing? Friends, we shouldn't be afraid of the UK not being a Christian country. The church we belong to is bigger than any single country. Our citizenship in heaven gives us a passport to every nation in the world, all worshipping and praising God alongside us. That is something to celebrate. That is something to shout about. That is something to sing God's praises about day after day. And um, if you're looking in on Christian things and you've not yet given your life to Christ, why not do so this morning? Why not use the next song as a a prayer to ask God to be ruler of your life? And if you're already a Christian, why not use the next song to recommit to God, to sing him a new song? Well, we're going to sing in a short moment, but first, let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are above all other gods that you reign over all nations, and that one day you will redeem all of creation. We thank you that we have so much to look forward to, that in heaven we'll sing alongside brothers and sisters from every tribe and tongue and nation. Help us to acknowledge your many gifts to us each day. Help us to be sensitive in the way that we talk to our friends and family about our faith. And help us to be confident that you are at work here in the UK and in Balham. In Jesus' name, amen.